and thank you for inviting me. Um, although I was saying to Alison just before we began that uh, I still wondered about the wisdom of her uh, invitation in some ways, um, in terms of the, the relationship of what I'm going to say to your overall endeavour um, within the, the, the group. Um, because in general terms, the, the tale I have to tell is not a very happy one. It's not a very happy story and it doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, although it, it has, well that's perhaps not entirely true, it has a possible happy ending which we might talk about. The, the ending isn't actually in the presentation itself. Um, but I hope there is something of interest and, and relevance um, to, to things that you're thinking about and perhaps aspects of your own experience. Uh, but we shall see. And I'm, um, I'm connected here, so I, I can only wander a, a certain <laughs> distance uh, away from the, the podium. I know, I know, very, very appropriate in some ways. Some of you will know some of my work and some of my preoccupations and some of the influences that bear upon my work. And, and one of those influences that, that often bears uh, quite large on my work is, is Michel Foucault. And uh, Foucault's ideas in various respects, particularly his ideas around what is truth, um, provides a kind of backdrop, a, a spine to, to many of the things uh, I'm going to talk about today. And in many respects, I'm taking up one of uh, Foucault's key questions when he asks, what have we become? So I want to think about what I have become uh, as a neoliberal academic. Um, so in some senses, I want to, I want to begin at least uh, by talking about myself. And I realize there's a certain indulgence to that, but I think it is fundamental to the story that I want to tell. And um, Foucault often talked about his concerns as being related to his own experiences. So at one point in one of his many interviews, he says that um, he often responded in his own work to something that was cracked, dully jarring or dysfunctioning in things I saw in the institutions in which I dealt with my relations with others. And a lot of what I want to say today is to do with discomforts around my relations and dealing with others in the institutions in which I work and operate. And he also said that, um, describing his work more generally, that each of my works is part of my own biography. For one or other reason, I had occasion to feel and live those things. And again, I'm talking about something that I feel and live and experience. And in my own career as, as an academic, um, I, I was invited to write a paper recently about my, my intellectual biography. And initially I thought, why would I want to write that? But actually I, it became quite an interesting exercise. I quite enjoyed it. And what I talked about was my, my transformation from a, a welfare academic, my own uh, university experience was, was in a, it, what, what, what one might call a welfare university. So my transformation from a, a, a welfare academic to a neoliberal academic. Although that transformation was also accompanied by a move from an elite university system to a mass university system. So it's not a, it's not a simple story in many respects. So what this is about today is, is interrogating what I am. Um, and this leads to a further set of questions about practice and about life in the modern university, which I think Michel Foucault can help us with. And perhaps you can also think and use these ideas to think about what you might or might not become or what you might or might not be, and who it is that you want to be in the contemporary university. So in thinking about these things, um, 
I'm interested in a, in a complex set of relations between truth governing, and I mean governing in Foucault's sense, that is the, the, the management of populations, if you like, how we are governed, economy and subjectivity, that is to say who we are. And I think it's important to think about these things um, in, in two senses. I think neoliberalism always has to be thought of in, in two general senses. We have to think about neoliberalism as something that's out there. It's, it's a set of economic relations. It's a set of structural and um, governmental relations which organize institutions, which provide uh, financial structures, which provide forms of exchange within which we operate. But it's also something that's in here in the head and, and in the heart, that neoliberalism is about who we are. It's about constructing us as particular sorts of subjects. It's, it's about how we think about ourselves and our relations to others. So neoliberalism is not simply a set of economic relations. It's, it's a form of subjectivity. It's a way of life, a way of being uh, in the world. And one way I find very useful in thinking about this is uh, drawing upon the typology, a typology that's uh, constructed by an Italian uh, economist come social theorist called Maurizio Lazzarato. And he talks about neoliberalism as resting upon five states of being. And I'm going to use some of these uh, as uh, ways of, of thinking about uh, the modern university and the modern uh, neoliberal subject as we go along. But his five states of being are, are individualization, inequality, insecurity, depoliticization, and financialization. And the, the first two, I think, in many ways are very straightforward, and we're very familiar with them as aspects of, uh, of neoliberal experience. The pressure towards uh, the individual as the focus of activity, uh, the uh, construction of the individual as a competitive, entrepreneurial, enterprising subject uh, who takes responsibility for themselves in relation to their work and their, uh, their life generally. And in relation to that, the, the differences, if you like, between individuals, inequalities, which provide a basis, a driving force for competition, uh, a basis of, of envy and striving uh, in, relation, in our relations to one another and our relations uh, 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 to other social groups. But alongside that, neoliberalism also produces other kinds of experiences, and in particular insecurity, which is an increasingly a fundamental aspect of neoliberal experience, what's often come to called now uh, come to be called now precarity, the, the sense of precariousness. Um, and this in itself is an increasingly uh, uh, obdurate fact of um, university experience. More than a third of all, K, all UK academics now work part-time and fixed-term contracts are increasingly the norm. Um, for example, LSE now only gives five-year contracts to its uh, academics, and those contracts are reviewed and, and renewed or not uh, on a five-year basis, and other universities are moving uh, towards this system. And this is a trend which can be seen across the world. There's a declining proportion of academics who occupy permanent and tenured positions, and many more who are employed part-time or on short-term contracts. And indeed, uh, Bruce McFarlane suggests that um, despite the benevolent image of universities, few employers, apart from perhaps the catering industry, have as many casual workers as do universities. But that insecurity goes even further, and I, I, it's something I'll pick up, upon, uh, pick up upon later. The insecurity which is related to the constant demand for performance for measurement, for output of various kinds. And, and one of the points about performance is that it has no history, that performance is something that has to be achieved freshly each year. 
in, in relation to each annual review or in a longer term process in relation to the university assessments, RAE, REF. Um, it, it increasingly doesn't matter what you did in the past, it matters what you're doing now in terms of your security, your, uh, if your esteem, the esteem in which you're held by others. And I want to go on to, to pick up on depoliticization and financialization more specifically in relation to the things I'm going to talk about. But in a sense, they're, they're, uh, to start with at least, they're self-evident. Depoliticization means the removal of the political from uh, our understanding of social processes and from our social relationships. And financialization means the, the importation, the insertion uh, of financial relations into many aspects of our, of our working life. So I'm going to use that as, as my framework. Does that make sense? Everybody yeah. happy with that? As I say, I'll, uh, particularly the last two, I'll unpack a little more uh, when they become relevant as we go along. So in relation to all of that, um, I also want to think about the how of truth. Um, Universities are, are quintessentially sites of truth. We are very much about the assertion of, of truth, the discovery of truth. Um, and research, even more specifically, is, is a project of, of truth. Uh, the assertion of particular truths which, are, which rest upon particular claims uh, and particular procedures. And the important thing to remember about, about Foucault's questioning about truth, he's, he's not concerned with what is true. And a lot of people, a lot of philosophers find that very difficult because most philosophy has a very strong normative basis to it. Um, Foucault's not interested in what is true, he's interested in the how of truth. And that is, he's interested in the system of truth and falsity itself. How do we establish what is to count as true? and what is to count as false? What are the systems and procedures and processes that allow us to make decisions about what counts as uh, true? And from his point of view, that's not a question to do with method. It's very much a question uh, to do with power and to do with politics. And as he says, nothing is true that is not the product of power. So, what I'm concerned with then is the ways in which we are, as academics, constrained and condemned, or condemned, to, to confess or discover the truth. And I want to take up both of those aspects. I want to think about issues related to the confession of truth, the truths we tell about ourselves, and to some extent the truths that are told about us, but also the discovery of truth, um, which is the, the, the truths we tell about others, the truths we tell about the world, which brings us back to the issue of research and PhDs and research studentships. And I've written, I've written a lot already in the past about the truths we tell about ourselves, and, and perhaps even more so the truths that are told about us. Um, and I'm trying to think a little more now about the truths we tell about others. And those truths are also related to our role in relation to government, our role as governors, our role in the process of governing, that is in the management of populations. And this has always been the case in, in the human sciences. Indeed, Foucault's argument is that in many respects, what we understand by the modern human sciences came into being in the 19th, late 18th, early 19th century as a response to the need to manage the new urban working class populations. And, and many of the bodies of knowledge, what he calls the human sciences, language, biology, um, uh, psychology, uh, sociology, social work, uh, sanitary engineering, all of those things in different ways as bodies of expertise had their 
initial raison d'etre in terms of this task of managing the population, bringing order and discipline to bear upon the city in particular. And the modern professions emerged in relation to those bodies of knowledge and in relation to that project, the, the, the joining up of power and knowledge, if you like. Um, so teachers and uh, social workers and uh, uh, probation officers and doctors and nurses and health visitors and sanitary engineers as professional groups had their points of emergence in, in the crisis of the city in, in the 19th century. But I, what I want to suggest is, is we're now, and you can, you can quiz me and press me on this, and this is something I'm trying to think about, that, that there is currently a new neoliberal iteration of this task of management, which is being addressed to the human sciences in particular ways. And I'll, I'll go on to, to un, unpack that. Um, so I'm going to say something about, about each of those. When, when, I, when, I, when I did the, the little heading for the, the PowerPoint, I, I meant points one and two uh, truths. But when it came out, I realized it actually said half truths, which had a kind of uh, it, uh, acts serendipitous um, uh, symmetry to it in some way. Um, so I just I, this this is familiar ground in, in some in some ways, and I and as I say I've written about this before. Um, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago, for example, that's called the I Spy Guide to the Neoliberal University, and the I Spy notion was to spot the various techniques and mechanisms that were used to tell truths about us. The various forms of, of reviews and rankings and ratings to which we as academics are increasingly subject. And I'll just remind you of some of those uh, in a minute. But I do want to give perhaps more emphasis than I have in the past and more emphasis than I think is given in some of the other contributions to this literature to the ways in which we are complicit in this process. That we both, on the one hand, happily subject ourselves to these measures, but also contribute to them in various ways. And I think the CV is a very interesting example of this, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, the modern CV is a, is, a, is a phenomenon to be considered uh, in all sorts of senses. But all of this is what uh, Roger Burroughs, um, in an in interesting recent paper, calls living with the H index. Um, and he gives a list of some of the things which now bear upon academic practice. Uh, we all have an individual H index. Um, I hadn't, until I was putting the paper together, um, looked at my H index, and I, I, I didn't actually really quite understand what it was. I now know what my H index is. I'm still not sure I understand the math mathematics on which it is based. If anybody can, quite, it, it can explain it to me. My H index is 75. I don't know what yours yeah. is. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've read... I've read the, the basis on which the, the, the metric is constructed, but I, re I really don't still quite, quite grasp it, I have to say. Um, and it's named after a, a Joel Hirsch who, who constructed it, that's why it's called the H index. Um, but there are, there are impact factors. Um, we, we have undergraduate teaching load uh, calculations, uh, workload calculations, uh, PhD supervision loads and, and averages and, and goals for those, annual grant income um, in relation to both departments and individuals. Um, our director was, was explaining to us, our head of department was explaining to us in my department at IOE the other day that that council had decided that they were setting a 5% target for research income growth for the next three years. Um, 
We work within the, the framework of the, the RAE and the, the RAF, REF in various ways and we can look at that by going to the FC website. We can download all the data for uh, universities and departments and individuals and on and on. It goes on and on. There, there are an immense range of these and, and increasingly there is a wide, a, a wide variety of different contributors uh, to this different um, rankers. Uh, so now there are sort of, if you like, um, lay uh, rankers. This, sorry, this is, this is the explanation of the H index, um, which we don't really need to bother with. But um, uh, in the United States, and to some extent it's beginning here, Rate My Professor is now a very powerful website. And when I've done a tenure uh, track uh, um, refereeing recently, for colleagues in the United States. Some of them do quote their rate my professor rankings and quote from the website uh, the things that students uh, have said about them. So people are making use of these things. Uh, there's also the, the best 300 professors, which is another website. So we can strive to become one of the best 300 professors. We can set that as a goal for ourselves. Uh, to, to make ourselves one of, one of those uh, uh, 300. Um, and in all of this, we are involved in a, in a process of, of inflation uh, and perfection and, and impact. Um, we're expected to make the most of ourselves, become one of the, the top 300. Uh, improve our H index factor, uh, make sure that our REF um, publications uh, get uh, three and four scores rather than one or two scores, um, that in, in, in our everyday life and in an increasing variety of ways we're incited and hailed to recognize ourselves in the terms of these measures and indicators. And to the extent that we respond to that hail, to the extent to which we fill in the form, answer the email, put pressure on ourselves to do better, put in another research application, then we are submitting ourselves to their tender mercies. These are regime, regimes of truth that make self-recognition possible. They're grids of intelligibility, as Judith Butler would put it, which offer us forms of recognition, forms of, of making ourselves intelligible. So they encourage us to think about ourselves uh, in these terms, in their terms. And the extent to which we take this seriously and the extent to which this, this inserts itself into um, our everyday practice, we, we are increasingly encouraged to fabricate ourselves in relation to some or all of these measures in different ways. And, and the CV, I think, is, is a particularly uh, highly developed form of such fabrication. Um, when, when I first started in universities and university work in Iraq for a long time, CVs tended to be a, a two or three page enterprise which roughly sketched out some of the things that you had done. Um, they now routinely run to 40 or 50 pages when you get applications for jobs, applications for promotion. And they consist of a whole variety, both of narratives of different kinds, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what I've done, this is me as a scholar, this is me as a teacher, this is me as an administrator, this is me making contributions to my intellectual community. And here are a set of measures which give an indication of how effective I am in those respects. Here is my score on rate my professor, here is my position on Microsoft Academia, here are the number of PhD students I've completed, here are the number of PhD examinations I've done, here are the number of uh, external examiner roles I've played, here are the number of uh, positions I've held in, in terms of committees uh, that I've chaired, uh, here are my publications, here are the reviews I've written, here are some quotations from people who are reviewing a book I've written. 
These things are put together to construct a version of us which is fabricated for the purposes of a gaze of some kind. It may be the gaze of the promotion committee, the gaze of the appointment committee, the gaze of the annual reviewer. And in a sense, this is a form of what uh, Haggerty and Eric Erickson call a data double. It, it's a fabrication which is, which is both who we are and not really quite who we are because we're always more than that. Uh, and perhaps we're always not quite that. Um, maybe that, that, that double is actually more than who we are. Um, but it is, it's not quite who we are. So it, it accompanies us. It, 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 goes with us as we move through university life and of course it, it grows and, and, and expands and uh, gets even longer as we accumulate more things that we can record about ourselves. It, it, it travels, it adheres to us as Haggerty and Erickson uh, put it. Um, it becomes a, a kind of meta-self a narrative of our excellence on productivity. And it's both expansive, in the sense that I said it's more than who we are, but on the other hand it's also reductive, because it reduces us to a set of measures and, and reviews and reports. Um, it's the multiplication of the individual and the constitution of additional self, as Mark Poster puts it. And in, in constructing ourselves in this way, we make ourselves auditable. We, we provide the possibility of, of audit. We offer up our numbers and our, our, our record of ourselves. Um, but we also in, inflate ourselves. We make ourselves perhaps more than we, than we are, more than we might be. Um, and as, um, as Colin Koopman puts it, while such doubles are sensibly seek uh, essentially refer back to particular individuals, they transcend a purely representational idiom. Rather than being accurate or inaccurate portrayals of real individuals, they're a form of pragmatics. So that they are pragmatics of the self. We make, my, make ourselves into a, a pragmatic representation uh, for the purposes of promotion, the purposes of uh, appointment. Uh, so we construct ourselves in this way, uh, pragmatically. But also, of course, they, they allow institutions to, to discriminate. They provide the basis of discrimination, of comparison, of striation. So they provide the possibility of ranking. Who among these candidates do we think is appointable? Do we want to put them in rank order? And, I mean, that was always true in many ways in terms of how appointments or promotions operate. Uh, but now this has become increasingly a technical process. And of course you could make an argument that that perhaps is fairer and more democratic and erases things like um, uh, institutional racism, institutional sexism, and replaces those with more objective basis of decision making in, in terms of measures and indicators. As Foucault says, not everything is bad, but everything is dangerous. So these things may not be bad, uh, in some respects, but they are dangerous. They are dangerous in terms of our subjectivity. So these, these numbers, as I said, provide us with, with grids of, of recognition. Uh, they, they provide us with ways of representing ourselves and they incite us to improve ourselves, to make ourselves better. Um, and you could say, uh, borrowing uh, the term from uh, Winton Higgins, well, no, from Haggerty and Erickson again, that, that there is within academia what they call a surveillant assemblage, that there's a whole range of these things which I've tried to indicate, which come together uh, to produce this thing that he calls, where he's applying it more generally to social life and our public life more generally but uh, a surveillant uh, assemblage. Um, and this is, this is supported by a vast global army of surveillance and, and conformance neo-professionals, which is something I'll come back to in a moment. Um, but this is not simply a, a technical 
process. It's, it's also, importantly, an affective process. And, and it's, it's crucially important in thinking about neoliberalism to think about the affects of neoliberalism. Um, and this is, um, this is Roger Burroughs. Uh, talking about something that's changed in British Academy. Many academics are exhausted, stressed, overloaded, suffering from insomnia, feeling anxious, hurt, guilt, out of placeness. The effects of pride and envy and guilt are woven tightly into these procedures and mechanisms of representation and comparison. We are made to feel guilty that we're not doing enough, we're not working hard enough, we're not producing enough, we're letting down our colleagues, we're letting down our department, we're letting down ourselves. We are being shameful in some respects. And we're also susceptible to envy those who produce more, do more, get more research grants, have more research publications than we have. So these are not, these are not simply technical processes, they're also affective in very fundamental ways. But they also potentially um, change our practice. They don't simply report on our practice, they also change our practice um, and become part of the way that we make decisions about our practice. And um, in a blog, there's an interesting blog that Sara de Richa, I'm sure that's not right, she's a Dutch academic, uh, writes, and this is uh, from a guest uh, post on her blog by Alec Rushford, who's done some research about academics and their decision making. And he says, for instance, a performance indicator like the journal impact factor was routinely mobilized informally in researchers' decision making as an ad hoc statement against which to evaluate the likely uses of information and resources and deciding whether time and resources should be spent pursuing them. So it's based on the reports of academics about their own decision making. In effect, um, what is being constructed is a kind of academicus economicus, um, uh, uh, an academic who is making calculations about the costs and benefits of particular kinds of actions. Is it worth writing for this journal as opposed to that journal? Is this research um, worth investing time in, in terms of making a research application? Um, the, the decisions are increasingly related to extrinsic aspects of, 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 of the decision, rather than the intrinsic worth and value or interest of uh, the research idea. So these, these, are, these are the truths we tell about ourselves and the truths that are told about us. And then I want to go on now to talk about the truths we tell about others. Um, um, and I, I, I want to think about whether, whether we are becoming um, what Nicholas Rose called grey scientists, and I'll come back to that later. And whether there is now something that we might call neoliberal research. Um, Raywin Connell, for example, wrote, recently wrote, we've not yet fully assimilated the profound consequences of the neoliberal turn for the basic project of education. So this is going back to the point that, that neoliberal or neoliberal systems of comparison and measurement don't simply report and record what it is we do, but actually are involved in changing what it is that we do. Changing the nature of our project, our educational project and our research project. He goes on to say, she goes on to say, the wider effect of neoliberalism on the knowledge base is an increasing technicization of knowledge and knowledge production. And I want to try and um, explore that, test that out. A similar point uh, is made by um, Alan Luke and, and Hogan um, 
And they argue that current debates over what counts as evidence in state policy formation are indeed debates of over what counts as educational research. Um, so this comes back to the issue of what, it, what counts as truth um, and what counts, therefore, as research in relation to the neoliberal project. Um, and this brings me back to the point that I mentioned at the beginning, that I'm interested in the extent to which we as academics are contributing both to the, the, the productivity requirements of the neoliberal economy, economy but also the, the, the requirements of government, the, the management of the population. And in that respect, perhaps the nature of research is changing to adapt itself uh, to those requirements. And as always, um, in relation to particular kinds of expert knowledge, research knowledge, or research techniques, um, these provide a language as well as procedures for thinking about and talking about uh, what goes on in the world. And as Nicholas Rose puts it, in analyses of democracy, a focus on numbers in particular is instructive. We've already talked about some sorts of numbers. For it helps us turn our eyes from the grand texts of philosophy to the mundane practices of pedagogy, of counting, of information and polling, and to the mundane knowledges of grey sciences that support them. And these, these grey sciences are uh, also what use another coin, another term, what, what Koopman calls infopolitical practices. Um, these are mechanisms and truths um, which are used to characterize organize and discriminate in relation to the population, to make decisions, that are used as a basis for making decisions in relation to the population. And in particular, I think we can think about this in relation to teaching. And one of the core elements of this, of course, is, is a focus on, on what works. Um, as Winton Higgins puts it, these, these new truths, these neoliberal truths, these truths of measurement and comparison and effectiveness of what works, uh, provide a discourse that suppresses re references to the effective strategic considerations that are embedded within them, things like power and control and self-interest and instead enshrine themselves in references to things like progress and efficiency, best practice, expertise, professionalism, coordination, uh, and of course the common good. Um, and I'll try and give some examples of that in a moment. And our increasingly um, whole fields of, of educational practice are now captured within uh, the regime of numbers. Um, at, at, certainly at both ends of compulsory schooling. Um, at the top end, um, GCSEs and GCSE performance um, is now riddled with uh, techniques of comparison and measurement in various ways, which are used to inform practice. Um, so schools now use varieties of forms of software to constantly monitor the performance of students, to make decisions about intervention, and to make decisions about who is worth investing in and who is not worth investing in, in terms of those students you can move across the CD boundary. So these things become a basis both for discrimination, striation, categorization, and for investment, if you like, financialization. So it's an, it becomes another form of financial decision making in terms of where we would best, where it would be best to use 
our resources in terms of time, money and effort in relation to certain sorts of students and where it's not. Uh, an economy, what I've called elsewhere, an economy of student worth. And this sort of data work, um, the collection, production, management, analysis, interpretation, maintaining of flows of data, and now Kelly and Downey puts it, part of everyday life in modern learning, knowing organisations. Um, and when I use the quotation like that, it, it suggests that Kelly and Downey are, are, are raising this as a critical issue. But in fact, the book that it's drawn on is how best to use data to inform teaching and learning in, in your school. Uh, and in that respect, it's, it's interesting. And all, all in more general terms, this is, this is talked about by various writers, um, uh, Jenny Osger, uh, Sotaria Grek, uh, Bob Lingard, Sam Seller, and others as governing by numbers. Uh, the, the use of numbers by governments and by institutions uh, to organize, uh, control, manage uh, their populations in a variety of ways. And these numbers become truths which are diffused and consumed. Um, and they are produced and transmitted in, under the control, dominant if not exclusive, of a great a few great political and economic apparatuses, obviously the state and its organisations, universities themselves, but increasingly commercial organisations. And there's another financialization embedded in this, which is a lot of this is profitable. You, you can make a lot of money out of ranking and measurement and comparison. And a lot of commercial organisations are now involved in this. Um, organizations like Microsoft and McKinsey and Pearson, but also things like the WS World University rankings. Uh, they're actually money-making enterprises. Uh, they're not simply there to provide information. They're also there to generate income for their, their owners, if you like. Um, this also led to, 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 to me looking myself up on Microsoft Academia um, but modesty prohibits me from telling you what I found there. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting in, in terms of if you log in um, and you can find a lot of, uh, about yourself. There were things that I didn't know about myself on <laughs> Microsoft Academia. Um, but again, the point, the point is that this is, this is a money-making enterprise. And of course, um, there are also uh, other kinds of organizations like the OECD who makes a lot of money people often forget, but they make a lot of money out of PISA. They don't do it out of their goodness of their heart. If you want to be in PISA, you have to pay for it. You have to pay to be PISA'd. Uh, and it's, it's, one, it's, a, it's a very, it's an increasingly important income stream for the OECD. And they're now developing a set of other tests which they're aiming at other parts of the education system and the economy to generate more money. And that tends to be wiped out as well when we talk about these things. It's all about you know, effective measurement, but it's, it, it's, this is a financial issue. And of course, some of you probably have seen that in terms of the next round of PISA, they've contracted out the production management and scoring of the test to Pearson. And Pearson will be paid to do that, and, and um, uh, at the OECD will pay them out of the, the money that they they get from the uh, countries that subscribe. Um, but these things, these things work at various, at various levels and, and th there is a, a research economy um, at the level of the um, uh, uh, educational research. Um, and things like this, this is from the, the Center for Effective Education at the University of, sorry, no, this is, this is the Educational Endowment Foundation toolkit. So, the, so DFID now, uh, DFID, the Department for Education now uh, channels most of its research funds into the Education Endowment uh, Foundation, together with money that comes from various philanthropic sources. Um, and the work of the foundation is, is based upon particular types of research. Um, randomized controlled trials and, and experimental models of research. And those are the, 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 the sorts of truths that they're interested in. And this is, this is 
justified in terms of its usefulness um, on, on a financial basis. Um, we know that the relationship between spending and pupil outcomes is not simple. Between 1997 and 2001, per pupil spending uh, increased by 85%. But over this period, improvements in pupil outcomes were marginal in most measures. At school level, it is clear that different ways of spending school budgets can have different impacts on pupil attainment, and choosing what to prioritise is not easy. And the idea of the, of the Education Endowment Fund toolkit is to provide you with an informed basis on which to make cost-effective decisions about particular school policies or pedagogies. So this is another kind of, of financialization. And of course, more generally, this, this seeks to displace individual professional decision-making and judgment. That rather than making a decision based upon judgment around a particular group of pupils, a particular location, a particular set of needs, you are encouraged to draw down the data and the outcomes of research from the website uh, and make decisions on the basis of, of that material provided uh, for you. Um, and there are a number of manifestations of this. Perhaps, perhaps the, well, there's also the Institute of a, uh, Effective Education. Um, uh, I put that up in part because this, this I received quite recently. Um, and it's, in, it's inviting people to attend this, the, this seminar um, on educational research uh, and look at how to ensure that research results influence policy and practice. So we have the Chief Analyst and Chief Scientific Advisor at the Department for Education uh, and Senior Ministerial Policy Advisor. Um, we have the Director of Research and Head of Research at NFER. Um, we have a Research Associate and Research Fellow from the Institute of Effective Education. Um, so this is, this is tempting to, to link up between research and policy um, in a very direct way, but again on the basis of particular kinds uh, of research. Um, I'm obviously on their mailing list, you're, you're probably on their mailing list as well, but I, I keep getting information from the, the Centre for Effective Education. Perhaps they want to convert me. Um, but one of the latest ones I've got, which I was going to wave at you and I can't find, uh, is, a, is a summer school on educational research. How to do educational research. But what they mean by educational research, a particular s style and form of research. But it's represented as educational research. The be all and end all of educational research. It's a very interesting fly in that respect. But the most, perhaps the most dramatic example of the way in which the relationships between government and, and research and what counts as truth has been forged is in relation to the No Child Left Behind program in the United States, in which case Congress specifically defined the sorts of research that would need to be used in relation to the programs uh, and the testing uh, of the No Child Left Behind program. So in terms of how schools are assessed, there are a set of procedures in terms of testing. And um, those tests are done, done privately by private, by private sector organizations. Um, they've, they've generated income uh, for those organizations somewhere around uh, seven to eight hundred million dollars thus far, probably more than that by now. Um, but also in relation, again, similar to the Education Endowment Fund, um, in decisions about what would be effective programs of pedagogy, curriculum, organisation for schools, that those decisions should be based, Congress requires, on uh, systematic, systematic empirical methods that draw on observation or experiment involving rigorous data analysis that are adequate to test the stated hypotheses using experimental or quasi-experimental designs. And this is, this is in the, the legislation which provides the funding for no child left behind. So these are, the, again, the sorts of truths 
that are mandated uh, by government uh, in relation to educational research. And these truths are also increasingly now available um, through various knowledge intermediaries like the Education Endowment Fund, uh, but things like the Best in Evidence Encyclopedia, What Works, Clearinghouse, Blueprint, blueprint Social Programs That Work, etc., etc. These are sites that you can go to to find useful truths. They, they are, are truth brokers, truth platforms, as, as uh, one might call them in relation to, um, to current parlance. Um, and all of this, all of this um, involves a, a dramatic depoliticization of the research enterprise. So standards, accountability, measurement are represented as matters of technical efficiency, rigorous experimental design, rather than normative choices. It's part of what uh, Diane uh, Stone calls the, uh, the rationality project of policymakers. The decisions are reduced to rational technical procedures and the political, the normative, uh, is erased. And of course, if you look at the ESRC website now, the ESRC actually call their research funding investments. They now invest in research. They don't fund it, they invest in it. And of course, what they're looking for is returns, and increasingly the returns are articulated in terms of impact. Um, and this, if I'm sure you're all aware of this, this is not old-fashioned impact, like how many people cite your research or whether you go and talk about it at conferences. Impact in the current iteration are real changes in social and economic practices in the world, changing the way in which people behave. So the impact narratives that were acquired as part of the RAF um, exercise had to demonstrate real world changes as the result of research. Not publications, not conferences, not citations, but behavioral change. So in all of this, I'm coming to an end, miss out some of this, um, that there is a very complex research economy. Um, so as researchers, we, we earn income directly or indirectly for our, our university. So we, we improve the budgetary position of our department, our university. We improve, secondly, our outputs and impacts in, the ways, in ways that contribute to our evolving meta self in terms of our research income and the uh, uh, the publications that we generate on, on the basis of this. And of course, they can be retranslated into income through things like REF, uh, because the higher the score you get, then the more funding you get from HFC uh, uh, on the basis of the REF ranking and judgments about uh, performance of each department in each subject in each university in the country. But also, there's another economic and financial aspect to this in that we contri contribute to the efficiency of business and government in making or saving money or driving up performance or quality. So in relation to schools, we can drive up standards. And those standards, as we know, because we're constantly told this by people like Michael Gove and David Cameron, relate directly to the international competitiveness of the British economy in relation to the global market. So we're contributing on a number of levels uh, to, the, to the economy. And we're participants in a number of ways in the economy. In effect, um, going back to Lazzarato, we, we, we become fractions of capital ourselves. The individual, the institution, our social relations become modelled on, he says, microcosms of the business, organised upon the individual's function as a molecular fraction of capital. 
And this, of course, relates back to the way in which we make judgments about the costs and benefits of our activity. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish. This, this leads to what the Marlene Morrison calls emaciated research, and in particular she addresses educational administration in a, in a, a recent paper which is, is very, very much worth reading. Um, but I finish with uh, a blog written by Ansgar Allen, who's the University of Sheffield, um, the op Open Democracy website. Um, he writes there regularly, um, uh, and I, I finish with it because I, I like it, but it makes the point. He says, under the economic yoke of advanced liberalism, today's university is distinguished not by its grayness and economic subjugation, but by a gaudy prolif proliferation of colour. It has become the rampant breeding ground of jobbing academics in search of the next big idea. Despite the bottom line mentality that besets it, where institutional coffers must be serviced before all else, economic restrictions are swiftly transformed into entrepreneurial opportunities, available only to those bold enough to reach out and grasp them. The perverse greed of this grasping hand, which in many cases is already in receipt of significant funds, is rarely remarked. And he goes on to talk about more about the grasping hand. So that's my, that's my thesis, um, and it's up to you now to decide whether it has any merit or not.